when our service was going to commence, we could not hear Sarah. And there was some panic behind there. Do you know, as I sat there thinking, that's the sermon for today. Those ministering to us through music, they were all ready, everything prepared. They knew exactly what they wanted to do, but there was nothing to project their ministry to us. And for me, that was not an accident. I believe it's deliberate, because today is Pentecost. Pentecost is the birth of the Christian church. The coming to earth permanently of God in the person of his Holy Spirit. And so I want to ask you this morning to sit tight. Put on your seat belts because we're going to take off. I will not be speaking from the gospel passage. I want us to go back to what actually happened on that day. First and foremost, when you look at the Bible, St. Luke's version of this event, you will see that Jesus actually promises all Christians, the gift of power, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is what John talks about in the last two verses of the passage that was read to us from John's Gospel, chapter 15, linking on to chapter 16. Jesus says in Luke's version, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. So in order to be faithful and effective witness to the Christian gospel, you need the Holy Spirit in you. Mark you, Jesus is not here speaking to non-Christians. Uh, those of you who read Greek, you can go back and check. Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it's plural. Because they already have the Spirit in them. You have the Spirit in you when you come to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Lord. You become a Christian. In John's theology, that differentiates you from the world. Because in St. John's uh, understanding of the world, we have two worlds. The world of the believer and the world of the non-believer. Once you accept Jesus as your personal savior, you get into the lifeboat. And it is you we are addressing this morning. So the Holy Spirit is sent down to bring all things to the remembrance of the believer so that the believer may remember Jesus, see and know Jesus, and be empowered to talk about Jesus. Friends, the Holy Spirit is given to the believer for a single purpose, to be a witness. So, let us not relegate or delegate what God has for all believers to a particular denomination, uh, the Pentecostal church, the charismatic church. I am a Christian. And I belong to the Anglican or Episcopal Church, but I am an Anglican charismatic. I am an Anglican 
Pentecostal. Claim it. Don't let anybody deceive you. You have to go to a Pentecostal church. We will be looking at a spirit-filled church towards the end of this presentation. Brothers and sisters, this gift is for every believer. You don't have to be in a Pentecostal or a charismatic or whatever name. Remain in the Episcopal church as a Pentecostal. That is where God has placed you. So, all, therefore, who repent of their sin and accept Jesus as their personal savior are promised the Pentecostal power. Now, how does one receive the Holy Spirit after becoming a believer? We go back to our passage. We read in verse 14 of chapter 1 of the Acts of Apostles, they all joined together constantly in prayer. Let's not forget that. And then the first verse, which was beautifully read to us from the Acts of the Apostles, first verse we read, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Friends, our faith is the faith for a community. We are a communion. There is nothing like being a lone ranger in the church of God. It is important. And my first challenge to all of us this morning is this. In your family, are you bonded together? Because that is where the church begins from. You know, some of us have the illusion that it is when we come to this place that we come to the church. You are the church. Let the church begin from your family. When your family comes on Sunday, my family comes on Sunday, his family comes on Sunday, her family comes, then we become again a bigger church. The problem with us Episcopalians, and I'm one, is that we always segregate. The church is not this building, it's us who believe in Jesus Christ and the potential believers in Jesus Christ who come to worship with us. So how do we receive the Holy Spirit? We are told you need, we need each other because we cannot be effective on our own. So the Holy Spirit makes the words printed, that is the Bible, come alive to us in our own situation and we pull out for ourselves treasures that are old and treasures that are new. So the first thing is to know the Bible. Do you have a Bible? <laughs> do you have a Bible? Oh yes, you do have a Bible. Do you read your Bible? That's our problem. The mind of God is in that sacred book. And where the mind of God is, you don't even go there. That's a, that's a second challenge. To receive the Holy Spirit, you must know the mind of God. And the mind of God is in the Bible. And it is the Holy Spirit who illuminates. It is the Holy Spirit who helps us to know the promises of God and encourages us on how to actually live on the promises of God. Next is that you've got to pray. Pray about the promises of God. 
pray about things you understand and things you don't understand. This week, I was wrestling with a problem for our son. And I thought, I believe the Lord gave me a solution. And so, I sent a mail. And my thought was that the mail, when it gets to where it's going, will be read in the morning because it was already 3 a.m. in Nigeria. And I prayed, press the button, it went. Within 10 to 12 minutes, there was a response. And the response sort of agrees with what I thought the Lord was saying. That's what we mean by the Holy Spirit being at work. Pray, brothers. Pray, sisters. Are you having problems? Do you have too many things from which you have to make up your mind? Take it to the Lord. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That is one of his duties, one of his responsibilities. And the final thing is, you need to be expectant. Some of us come to church with what I call a low expectancy level. And such people, when they leave after the service, you ask them, how was the service? Oh, well, it was okay, same. I hope that's not you. And there are those who come, whether it is to the church or to their home group, study group, or it is their own personal Bible study, their expectancy level is quite high, and the Lord meets them there. I challenge you this morning by asking, what is your expectancy level? What is your level of expectation when it comes to the promises of God in the Bible? Jesus says, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. It's a promise. Do you believe that? Or, as a student said to me from Sydney, he came to Kaduna, and we were sharing the movement of the Holy Spirit, people being healed, solutions being given to problems. And he got up. I gave him the opportunity. He came to stay with us in the diocese. And he said, this is all in the past. We don't believe this is these days. And my priest took him to task. I had to rescue him. <laughs> this is a real. They're not just in Africa. They're here. How do you deal with people who are just sold to drug addiction? Right? How do you deal with people who are so corrupt in everything they do? It's possession. It's demonic possession. And Jesus says, you have the authority. It's in your hands. Let's now move on to what actually happened on the day of Pentecost. And I'm going to ask that when you get back, please read that first lesson again. Know exactly, have an idea of what happened on the day of Pentecost. Three signs I want to draw your attention to. The first sign is that we're told as soon as they were praying, there was a sound of wind. Wind came in. You see, to that culture, to the Jewish culture, wind, right, and spirit have the same word, ruach. So it was ruach that came in, representing the presence of the power of God. It's the same thing in the Arabic language, you hear ruhu, say ruhullah, the spirit of God, the power of God. What does that mean? 
Go back to Genesis chapter 1. At creation, we are told the Spirit of God just moved and started creating. That's the power of God. So wind, therefore, gives an idea of the presence of the power of God. So God at Pentecost, therefore, was delivering, as it were. He was birthing his new Israel, his new community. And we are one of them. We are members of God's new community. Secondly, we read in verse 3, and divided tongues of fire appeared. And people believe these things don't happen today. God has not changed. Go back to the Bible. The Bible says he's the God of yesterday, today, and forever. God speaks to us within our context. We hear, read about fire. Fire purges. Fire burns all the impurities in our lives. And that's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit, the power of God, refines. He refines us. He melts all the impurities, the practices, the, 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 the teachings that actually go or impede our witnessing, bearing witness to the saving power of God in Jesus Christ. And the third thing we read about is in verse 4. We read about the Holy Spirit coming down and the people began to speak in tongues. Yes, I know there are places where this is abused, where they actually teach people how to speak in tongues. You can't justify, you can't prove that from scripture. But, brothers and sisters, it happens. As it happened on that day, it still happens today. When the first time I had my experience of baptism in the Holy Spirit, my tongue was moving. And because I thought I was a decent Christian, I said, no, 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 I'm not going to do this. No. It did go and came back. I wrestled all night, and I'm not kidding. Eventually, I had to give up. But it's a gift. Now, what does that mean? Very quickly, first and foremost, scholars give us two interpretations. That is what we call glossolalia, which is speaking in tongues. This is an ecstatic way of speaking that sounds unintelligible. And it is unintelligible. But within the group, this is why initially I said to you, be with a group. It sounds unintelligible. But there may be some people who are believers within the group who have the gift of understanding. And then they tell us what is happening. I had this experience. I was preaching in a small church. And in the pulpit, somebody got up and started speaking a language that no one understood. <laughs> and I started praying. I thought I knew what she was saying. But I wanted, I didn't want it to be two people alone. And I was praying. And suddenly, when she finished, there was silence. I kept quiet. And somebody got up and said exactly what I thought God was telling us in the church. And the service ended. That's glossolalia. The other is the capacity to communicate with people in ways that go beyond human understanding. And you see that in that passage. Go to verse 8. People came from the various parts of the world. And they heard this untrained, uneducated, no PhDs among them, no MAs among them, not even first degree among them. These were just rustic people. And they started speaking in the different languages. Brothers and sisters, it happens. God can use 
anything to meet us at our points of need. Finally, how do we recognize a Holy Spirit-filled church? Because this is what we want. Initially, I said to you, and I maintain it, I am an Episcopal charismatic or Pentecostal. So how do we recognize a spirit-filled church? First and foremost, a spirit-filled church is a learning church. I want Tony to put up for you, in case you get bored with what I'm saying, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. First, symbol, sign of a spirit-filled church is that that church is a learning church. Learning means you based your sermons, you base your discussions on the New Testament. That is what is known as the apostolic uh, uh, prophetic teaching, the apostles' teaching, and then the Old Testament, right, which is prophetic teaching. We base our sermons on the Word of God. But that does not stop us from academically studying the word of God, reading scriptures, looking at the original languages, and letting the Bible come alive. So a spirit-filled church is committed to the word of God. And so I ask again, what is your level of the knowledge of the Bible? You cannot survive without knowing and believing in the Bible. Number two, a spirit-filled church is a caring church. We do that a lot here, but one thing I want to add to all we're doing here is simple, simply this. If you look at that passage, we're told that amongst the early church people, everybody that owned anything brought it for everybody's need, to meet everybody's need. But if you look at it critically, you will see that not all of them did that because we're told they were still meeting in some homes, which means these people still had their property with them. But there is something I want to leave with you as a believer, and it is that statement from Solomon in First Chronicles chapter 29. Solomon says, Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from you. What have you that are not given, says Paul? Brothers and sisters, whatever the Lord has given to you, God expects you, expects me to use it for his own glory as we meet the needs of our people. And the last sign of a spirit-filled church are two. One, a spirit-filled church is a worshiping church. A worshiping church. Look at it in that, in the entire passage there. We're told they kept meeting and praising and worshiping the Lord. My New Testament professor, Professor C.K. Barrett, he made me do a research as an undergraduate long time ago, and I had to go through the New Testament, and I came up to confirm what he had taught us, to say there is no orthodox way of worship in the New Testament. There is no fixed, agreed way of worshiping God in the New Testament. So it could be informal, as we're doing here, this is formal and informal, or formal as we do in the main sanctuary. However, three characteristics we must look for in any spirit-filled church. Number one, the worship must be joyful. There is nothing as ugly and disappointing as a joyless worship. Two, the worship must be dignified. To dignify God and to dignify his children who are worshiping him. And the third thing is that worship must be celebrative. 
we've got something to celebrate. We're celebrating this morning. A baby that is being baptized, that is celebration. God has blessed us, and we bring this child to God to bless, and we give the child back to the parents, go and bring up this child in my way. So you have a responsibility. Finally, a spirit-filled church is an evangelizing church. In evangelism, to evangelize, you must have something because you cannot give what you don't have. St. John the Divine, we must be an evangelizing church. And what does that mean? Our job is to be witnesses. That is why we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, go into the world and declare Jesus as the Savior of the world. So a spirit-filled church is one that calls those in the world to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, on this Pentecost Sunday, I ask you, have you come to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? If yes, the Spirit of the Lord is in you. The second song the team gave us this morning has one word. Fill us with your Spirit. That's what we need to pray for all the time to be filled, to be empowered, so that we become a spirit-filled church with the conditions I've given to you. But it has to begin with me, my family, and then the church family. Amen.